Okay, good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone to today's training for uh, planning and response to catastrophic events at contaminated sites. My name is George Nicholas. I will be your moderator today. We'd like to welcome all the in-house attendees. Place is packed. Everyone's sitting in the back. That's not a good sign. Move up to the front because we are a happy, loving DEP family here. Uh, we'd like to welcome also webinar attendees. Uh, right now we have uh, uh, well over 100. Uh, we have uh, a lot of people on the webinar. Uh, because of that, uh, let me just explain a few things. Uh, as far as continuing education credits or CECs, today's program has been approved for two scientific technical CECs. Uh, however, there are attendance requirements <clears throat> for in-house attendance. Uh, you cannot miss more than 45 minutes of the training and make sure that you sign in and sign out of the training. <clears throat> Excuse me, that's very important. That's how we track attendance and uh, confirm your attendance. For webinar participants, you must be logged on for the entire time uh, and answer three out of the four test questions. <clears throat> as far as the attendance certificates, they are issued by the LSRPA. How that works is that DEP will compile a list <clears throat> based on um, the attendance requirements <clears throat> for both webinar and in-person attendees. We will send an email to all, <clears throat> excuse me, eligible uh, people who registered for the course <clears throat> and also indicated that they are interested in receiving CECs. Uh, at that point, the EP will email a link uh, that will be to all people who would like uh, CECs and that link will uh, take you to an LSRPA webpage where you will have the ability to uh, access uh, the CEC certificate. Uh, LSRPA charges a $25 processing fee for that service. So for people on the webinar, this is where you need to pay attention. Uh, in order to be eligible for CECs, webinar participants must answer three out of the four webinar test questions. This is an example of one of the test questions uh, where we ask, you know, quartz is harder than calcite. For all mineralogists here and geologists, we know that that is true. Uh, so this will come up. Webinar participants will have one minute to answer that question. After that, that question will disappear and you will no longer have a chance to answer that. Just some important reminders, especially for in-house attendees, that is to please mute your cell phones. And also, if there are conversations or cell phone calls, please take them outside of the room. We also ask you to access the room through the side door, just because the back doors make a lot of noise when they open and close, and a little bit of a distraction. We would ask your cooperation with that. As far as questions and answers, it's very important that if there are questions in room, that you wait for the microphone. That's so people can hear the question on the webinar, as well as in the room and also hear the answer. Webinar participants, once we do get to a question and answer period, we'll open up that question and answer period on the webinar and you will have the ability to type in a question and submit it. And we'll try to get to all questions by the end of the program today. So right now with all the technical guidance document training sessions that we do, we just provide a quick update in regard to technical guidance. Uh, and I am the chairperson for guidance development and we'll just go through this pretty quickly. So to date, we have uh, 24 documents that have been completed. This document that we're training on today is the 24th. Uh, five are currently in development, and all technical guidance is posted on the DEP's SRP webpage at the address indicated at the bottom of the slide. Here we go. This is the first webinar question. We didn't want you to wait too far or wait too long. So webinar participants, you have one minute to answer this question. Anthony, we can open up the webinar participation poll. Okay, here we go. So webinar participants have the ability to answer this question. And if I were you, I would because you only get three out of four shots at this. Uh, so to date, 24 technical guidance documents have been completed. We're going to poll the audience because they've been paying close attention and they're ready to answer this question. How many people here think that that is true? Show of hands. Very impressed. They have been paying attention. How many think it is false? Okay, that's a good sign. People are paying attention. So we have uh, 28 seconds to go, 38, 30 seconds to go. We'll do a little dance in here, keep people entertained. Uh, the reason, again, we give people one minute to do this is in case they have been uh, a little bit asleep at their computers. They will have the ability in one minute to answer this question, and it's very important. Uh, so, look, 96% have answered. I'm very impressed with the webinar audience today. They are sharp. It's clear that they are sharp. Uh, 52 seconds, 55, 56, 7, 8, 9. Okay, we can close that. Thank you, Anthony. 
And just so everyone knows what the answer is, as soon as we get back, it is true. So you guys had all had the right answer. Just wanted the webinar audience to know how sharp the people in the room are. Uh, so let's get back to guidance development. So this, these are the round one technical guidance uh, committees and the documents that have been completed. Um, also, it shows when documents have been revised and when training has been conducted. These are the first nine. We also have uh, 19, actually, documents that have been conducted or completed as part of the round one guidance. Uh, what is important, I think, is to at least to identify what documents have been revised. If you go onto the web page and you see anything that says version 1.2 or more, could be version 2.0. If a document is revised and it's a significant revision, it will be a 2.0. If it's not, it would be a 1.2, 1.3, 1.4. And it would have the date when that is revised. In addition to that, any time a document is revised or updated, we send out a listserv just to make sure that the uh, public knows that the document has been revised and that there is a new version available. These are the round two technical guidance committees. Uh, child care centers will be the next one out. That is the third one down there. Right now that has gone through the comment period and they have been revising the document. They have run into a few issues. Child care and how that is handled within the department has evolved uh, and has now moved to one of our field offices. Uh, a lot of that information has been trying to, or the committee has been trying to incorporate that, that information into the document and so that's why it has been a while in getting that document posted final. But that will be final uh, shortly and that will be the next one that we will train on as well. The bottom two commingle plume or performance monitoring, we're trying to hustle to get those documents out at the end of June. Uh, we have a meeting uh, shortly, at least on commingle plume, that's uh, the one that I'm involved in, and we are trying to, uh, to make sure to get that document out. A lot of information and, and discussions occur in both of those committees and hopefully we will get them out. The last two documents on the bottom, they are being uh, they were, those committees were formed to support the issuance of the remediation standards. They will be issued when the remediation standards are issued for comment. The whole idea is that they go out to support the issuance of the remediation standards. Uh, those documents are almost finished and will be ready when, that, when the remediation standards go final or go out for comment. Uh, other ongoing document updates, the vapor intrusion technical guidance is being updated. That is almost actually completed. They're working hard on that. It's going through final review right now. Just wanted to also note that there is an ITRC training that will occur September 26th and 27th in Somerset, New Jersey. Uh, the part of the John Boyer, who is the committee chair for that uh, guidance committee, is also one of the main presenters for the ITRC guidance. The document that is being updated right now is incorporating information from the US EPA document as well as an ITRC document. So this training actually will be very relevant for New Jersey uh, LSRPs as well as the regulated community and the department staff. Impact of groundwater, there's actually four documents that were associated with impact of groundwater. These documents are all being incorporated into one document. People used to say, oh, you need to check uh, impact of groundwater. We've never had one impact of groundwater document. Uh, we will now. The committee is working hard to incorporate those four doc documents, compile those four documents into one document. All that information as far as impacted groundwater can be found on the soil remediation standards webpage, and that uh, web address is located at the bottom of the slide. Other technical documents that are being updated are listed here. Of note is the middle one, landfill guidance, that was just updated in May of 2016. All the other documents uh, listed on this page are a little bit old, they're from 2015, but just post it uh, for your personal edification. Okay, right now we're uh, moving on with our program. I'd like to introduce Bill Call. Bill Call is going to give us uh, an update on the LSRPA. So, Bill? So he's... Like Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Bill Cole. I'm with Penn Jersey Environmental, also Board of Trustee member of um, SRPA. Uh, first, I want to thank our sponsors. Um, as you can see, we've got uh, quite a few. Um, also, uh, Super Well wanted me to mention uh, Rutgers, who just came on as an academic sponsor the past couple of weeks. Um, and without them, we wouldn't have these wonderful breakfasts and events. So, thank you. Okay, uh, continuing ed requirements. Over so through your licensing period, you have to get 36 credits. I think everyone probably knows this already. Um, three ethics, 10 regulatory, 14 technical, nine discretionary. Uh, usually end up getting more regulatory anyway uh, through the course of the three-year licensing period. 
Um, the new rules and proposed shouldn't be there. Um, break it up into two uh, categories, programs, um, which basically are college courses, um, universities, LSRPA events, DEP training. Um, includes alternative verifiable learning formats, which would be webinars like the folks attending today. Uh, no more than 18 of the 36 uh, CECs are allowed for a three-year cycle. Uh, continuing ed activities, uh, teaching a course, preparing, giving presentations, presenting papers, etc., are also eligible, but again, up to 18 credits per license period. A uh, couple recent activities uh, or initiatives, um, the LSRPA is trying to help out the new up-and-coming crop of LSRPAs, or excuse me, LSRPs. Um, we have a resume portal uh, online. Uh, it's a free service to all LSRPA members uh, who are graduating, will graduate with a degree uh, and looking to become LSRPs or just getting hired. Um, they upload their resumes to their, our LinkedIn page, uh, which again is linked from the website. Um, the resumes, its names, etc., are then posted on our website, and interested firms can select from a pool of, of applicants. Um, we've also got a member breakfast coming up uh, in a, on the 17th, New Swan Diner, Oakhurst. Um, There's going to be a short presentation on responsibilities and obligations of the LSRP. Then, as usual with these events, is an open forum, discuss items of interest, topics, hot button issues, etc. Um, and uh, anyone is, is welcome to attend those. Um, we usually get one to two credits uh, approved by the board. Dr. Whitman will weigh in on that. Uh, next, we've got yeah. volunteers on our committees. Our committee list over the past few years has grown a little bit. I won't read them all to you, but if you're interested and you're a member or want to become a member, please do get active in the committee. I know personally, being in the risk management uh, as a co-chair of the risk management committee, now co-chair of the continuing ed committee, I learn a lot. So get active in the committees if you are interested. Uh, if not, you, know, you could be missing a lot of good information. Uh, a few upcoming events, uh, June 28th, converting contaminated properties and municipalities to into assets. It's basically a SARA municipal site type of uh, presentation to be followed. And it's not listed here in the fall. There's going to be a kind of a brownfields resource, uh, resources funding type seminar as a follow-up to this. September 13th is our next uh, ethics course. Uh, September 27, due diligence, uh, continuing education course, location is determined. Uh, then October 25th, 26th, is a good chance to get most of your technical credits. Uh, fundamentals of contaminant chemistry and application uh, in subsurface and contaminant transport and remediation. Uh, October 27, uh, we have an emerging contaminants workshop. Uh, that's in East Windsor, also six and a half technical credits. And that's it. Thank you. If he doesn't have any questions, it's going to be the next guy. Then. Thank you, Bill. So uh, I'll just continue with our uh, presentation today. Right now, I'd just like to go over uh, the presenters for today. Our uh, Neil Giorli. Neil is an LSRP with French and Perello Associates. Also, we have uh, Nicholas Santella. Nick is a uh, PhD with uh, Brownfield Science and Technology, Inc. And also Gary Pearson from the department. He's assistant director of the New Jersey uh, DEP's emergency management program, which is our emergency response section. Uh, so both these guys have bought a tremendous amount, or all three of these guys have bought a tremendous amount of uh, uh, expertise and information to the, uh, the committee. And we'll just also discuss uh, some of the committee members in a second. Uh, but first, wanted to just go over some of our training objectives. One thing we wanted to do is at least inform people of exactly what was in the document and how to use the document. Just a review of some of the comments that came back. It was kind of important to make that distinction. Some people felt that the document was actually uh, for a different purpose. And I think really the, the document really is to, to guide people, to pre help people prepare, and help people perhaps avoid some of the mistakes that we saw that happen during Superstorm Sandy, which really was one of the drivers in development of this guidance. The other thing is we hope that you can take away after this uh, presentation is to identify some of the relevant factors and important issues when planning and preparing for catastrophic events, both anticipated and unanticipated, and also to figure out what your current extent of planning is and whether you need to perhaps 
increase or enhance that level of planning. This is a list of our committee members. The committee was uh, one of the best committees that I've worked with. They were excellent, very responsive, a lot of good discussions happened within the committee. Uh, Mike Burlingame uh, actually is in the, the audience. Hey, Mike, you can raise your hand. Mike kind of took over the, the committee. Janine McGregor was the committee chair. Janine had followed or uh, taken the committee all the way through the process of issuing the draft document. Janine took on a new job with the Site Remediation Professional Licensing Board, and she had to step down. So we appreciate Mike stepping up to the plate and shepherding this through to document issuance and also in, in training development. Uh, we also had uh, you know, a number of DEP staff as well as the regulated community stakeholders that were involved. They brought a lot of tremendous real life experience to the table in a lot of the discussions. And I had asked when the presenters come up, just provide a little bit of background on what they do so that you have a better feel for why they are up here presenting and, and why they were involved in development of this guidance. I'd also like to point out that um, one of the additional assistance provided by people, that is uh, Allison Stidworthy from the DEP, she's also in the room. Allison is a new recruit for the DEP, uh, started recently. As one of her first jobs, she was assigned to come help us within the, uh, the committee and did an excellent job in preparing slides and really pushed this training forward. We had a tight time frame, and Allison did a tremendous job in assisting us. So thank you, Allison. Okay, so right now I'd like to turn it over to Neil Giorli, who's going to talk a little bit about uh, the background on the document. So, Neil? We're at 26 now. I'm not sure what your protocol is here, but in as much as it's Flag Day, I thought it'd be appropriate if maybe we could say the Pledge of Allegiance, George. Would that be all right? It's hot, Oh, you got him standing up. For everyone, could uh, stand. Appreciate that. Thank you, Neil. People, people in the webinar can join in if they would like. I would certainly encourage it. So I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic, which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Excellent job. Thank you, Neil. All right, my background, real quick. Um, I started with the Monmouth County Health Department in 1981. And in 1984, I joined the department here in Trenton in uh, what was the old Hazardous Site Mitigation Administration uh, under George Berkowitz at the time. and. Uh, I worked, had the pleasure of working with some people who are still here at the department. You may know them. Kathleen Coons is in the office, in the audience today. Uh, Bob and Ann Hayton. And uh, Ken Clue was part of our group, too. And the group was associated with doing circle of preliminary assessments and site investigations and hazard ranking system using the MITRE model, as well as doing RECRA facility assessments and RECRA <coughs> facility investigations. Um, from there, I did transition out into the private sector in 1990, working as a consultant. Kathleen's husband had left the department, kept telling me, come on out, Neil, there's a lot of free money to be made out here in consulting. So it's been a good ride and uh, quite enjoyable, and I've learned a lot both in the public sector and in the private sector. I've not really been involved with a committee like this. I am involved with the ASTM, and I've worked in the stakeholder group consensus process with them. But this was a somewhat new experience, and it was a really excellent learning experience and very enjoyable working with the committee members. Um, so with that, let's move on into the background of the technical guidance. Wrong way. Wrong way. Wrong way. Okay. Thank you. Um, the... The event that we all know, Superstorm Sandy, triggered a response by the department. Uh, you know, they, they issued pre-Sandy listserv announcements, and they were useful to a certain degree, certainly to me, to help prepare my sites. But at that point in time, without any actual pre-planning, there really wasn't a whole lot we could do. And they tend to issue those listserv announcements um, with respect to snowstorms, et cetera, since that point in time. But um, what the department did was get together after the storm, key players at the department, focus on it a little bit, and kind of come up with some ideas about uh, you know, lessons learned, what needs to be done. 
And one of the things that needs to be done is this technical guidance, so sort of an outcropping of the get-together by the department after the storm. Um, as people who get involved with site remediation program sites, part of this guidance is to help us understand what we, we should be thinking about um, in terms of our remedial systems beyond their actual remedial function. You know, you get together with a client at uh, the SRP site, we talk about and map out a plan and come up with a work plan to deal with the contamination, but the mindset maybe really isn't there about dealing with a catastrophic event and how you're going to prepare or plan for that. So again, this is where we're going with this technical guidance. Okay, the intended use. Um, who's the audience here? Well, uh, as with most of the technical guidance, it's got a preamble talking about the investigators, the persons responsible for conducting the remediation, the LSRPs. We use the umbrella term investigators throughout the guidance. We also have on some of the slides acronyms that are typically used, and for those of you who might, might not be familiar with the acronyms, please you know, raise your hand and ask a question. Hopefully we can help you out with that. The investigator is you know, anybody who's using the guidance to plan for or respond to the catastrophic event. And, and one thing I was curious about as I was going through this, investigators in the audience and out there in the webinar land, Certainly here, could I get a show of hands of how many people have multiple sites that they are dealing with as investigators, LSRPs? Okay, there's a few. You know, and in that context, I'd like you to think about this training and this guidance as we're going through. Um, you know, how well can you manage sites that have geographic differences, stages of the remediation differences? You know, really the whole intent here is to try and get you to think in terms of catastrophic events and your, your site remediation program sites. Uh, one item we did see in the public comments as we went through, uh, as, we, as we received them back, quite a few regarding, is this guidance mandatory? It's not, it's not tied to a regulation. It's not uh, necessary according to SARA. It's um, just good common sense planning. You know, think in terms of the conceptual site model. Not a regulatory requirement, but a very useful tool when it comes to dealing with your contaminated sites. Where, and again, this kind of leads into another uh, another comment, series of comments we got concerning sites where you might have areas of concern in a, a bigger site, like an operating facility, and whether or not these following these guidance should preempt something in the regulatory program. And no, if there's a regulatory program at a site where it's say a repro site and it's got a contingency plan requirement, you've got a contingency plan in place. This guidance isn't meant to usurp that. It's more or less to work in conjunction, or but certainly be focused at the area of environmental concern or the part that is the site remediation program parcel. Um, to that end, someone slipped in a picture. I don't know if it was Allison, but we, we do have a resident pirate who was working on the committee with us, and that would be uh, George Nicholas. And if you can just help us out with this. We are. Yeah, they're more like guidelines than actual rules. <laughs> I, I, I see why they said you really are a natural born master of ceremonies. <laughs> what is a catastrophe? Now, again, it's, it seems like it should be intuitive, you know what a catastrophe is, but when you really think about it, what is it? So the first thing we had to do as a committee was come up with a working definition, which evolved we settled on it in the first meeting, but it was tweaked a little bit along the way. One key point that didn't change, catastrophic event in the context of a site remediation program site in this technical guidance is not a slow onset long-term event such as those associated with climate change. So kind of put that aside, we're talking about different types of events. Um, natural human cause, limited duration, significant magnitude. They would have an adverse impact on infrastructure, public health, and the environment. Um, it could be localized as far as municipality uh, to multi-state to an overall regional area of impact. It may be an anticipated event, such as a storm, or it could be an earthquake or a wildfire or something like that that's not anticipated. This is where the guidance is supposed to come in and be helpful, that you don't have to think a whole lot, that you can go to the plans that you have and pull the trigger on them. 
Um, anybody have any other examples that they want to speak up about as far as what they think is catastrophe? You know, personally, many of you know there was a uh, a recent deadline that went by on May 7th, and I was doing work both in the office and using a thumb drive to work at home over the weekends and in evenings. The thumb drive crapped out about a week before the deadline came up, and to me that was a catastrophe, but in the context of this guidance, not a catastrophe. Now, what about something like this? Some of you, maybe all of you recall, there was a, a big fire in, uh, in Edgewater, and it was declared a local emergency. Would it be something that we should be worried about or should trigger in this, uh, this guidance at an SRP site? You have a comment over here, Neil. Uh, also, when you get the mic, could you just state your name when you're uh, commenting? William Buchanan, uh, Site Remediation Program. Uh, a number of years ago, there was a kind of a catastrophe on the uh, Delaware River. It was partially, uh, uh, it was a combination of two things, both uh, large rain uh, in the watershed, uh, as well as the need to uh, relieve uh, uh, dam pressure, so that it was kind of a combination of the two, and it actually created a great deal of uh, flooding and uh, catastrophic conditions all along the Delaware for, I think there was even flooding down here in, in Trenton, but along uh, the whole border of the state. But it was a combination of both uh, natural and, uh, as a result, actions that had to be taken uh, for uh, dealing with that catastrophe of releasing the floodwaters that uh, uh, couldn't be held. And, and I think that probably is a good example. Um, you know, if, if it's something where the state's going to announce that we're going to uh, relieve pressure behind dams or levees or whatever the case may be, you've got a little pre-warning. Um, but again, the idea here is if you're along a, a water course such as the Delaware River, or you've got a SRP site that you're managing, you want to be prepared for such events. So you want to look at that site in the context of this guidance and think about how you might be able to improve your site, harden it, make it more resilient. And we'll get into that along the way. But yeah, that's, that's a good example. Thank you. Um, it came to light, I wasn't aware of this, that this complex was actually built on a closed SRP site. So what does that mean? You're the LSRP, you're in some kind of long-term monitoring of perhaps that is the cap. So you need to certify every two years that the cap's in place, possibly going to have an effect on your annual certification, not to mention what could all the water that's now being poured on here with possible breaches in the cap due to the heat stresses, could that affect uh, contamination that was supposedly not mobile or contained? So these are the kind of things you have to think about. What about somebody who's got a site on the other side of the street? They know, they see this news flash, they know they've got a site directly. Looks like the wind's driving the smoke from left to right. Is that site going to be impacted? Is this something they should trigger in a plan for? This is something they even have a plan about. And all, we want to get you to think by virtue of having this technical guidance out there on the street. So yeah, the purpose of the guidance, uh, equip the investigators to assess the vulnerabilities of their sites, be able to maintain site conditions during a catastrophic event, and very important, be able to implement the steps for recovery post-event. And I think to me, and probably hopefully to many, it would be just a reminder that some degree of pre-planning is worthwhile, even if it's just a checklist, to-do list, and, and a list of your emergency contacts that you can refer to easily. It's common sense. Be prepared. I wasn't prepared for the storm at home. I spent the last two days before Sandy going to every hardware store in Monmouth County trying to buy a generator. That's a little too late. And that's the point we're trying to make with the guidance. Don't wait until it's too late. Factors to consider, plan and prepare for the impacts of the catastrophic event at contaminated sites. Um, 
there's a the guidance contains a list of the type of catastrophes you might be faced with. I think people can understand the natural disasters and the human caused disasters, you know, train derailments, acts of terrorism. Um, so these would be the types of events you would be thinking about. You have to put them in the context of your site specific conditions. Um, at some point, you're going to have your initial receptor evaluation completed, receptor evaluation completed. You're going to know your contaminants of potential environmental concern. You're going to be aware of the nearby uh, environmentally sensitive natural resources. And you want to combine all this information as you're going along and consider what might happen if a catastrophic event occurs as far as what you know about your site and what could change. Again, we're trying to get you to think along these lines and be prepared to circumvent those problems should a catastrophic event happen. Okay, here we go. We're going to take this over. <laughs> Audio, <laughs> da, 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 da. Okay, so this is for webinar participants. This will be your second question. And this is a test your knowledge question. And the question is, when preparing and planning for a catastrophic event, one consideration would be, and if we could open up the, uh, the poll, that would be great, Anthony. Okay, there we go. So uh, attendees on the webinar, please make your selection. And again, you have to answer three out of the four questions. Answering four would be preferred, but we allow you to answer three out of the four. So the answers are A, site-specific conditions, B, constraints, which would be logistical, regulatory, etc. C, the current status of the remediation, or D, all of the above. And those D's all of the above, they always get me, because you're never sure. So we have uh, 20, 28, 29, 30 seconds. We're going to pull the audience. So how many think it is A? OK, how many people in the audience think it is B? How many people in the audience think it is C? Well, these guys are good. How many people in the audience think it is D? How many people okay. in the audience think I put everybody on the webinar asleep? I don't see any hits. <laughs> nope, let's see on the... Uh, I think they're coming in. 95% have voted. Okay. So one minute, we can close that. So the poll is now closed. And uh, as soon as we close the, uh, the screen, you can hit the next button and it tells us what the answer is. There you go. The answer is D. So just everyone on the webinar to let you know, everyone in the room had it correct. I was very impressed. These people are paying attention. So again, if you could take the uh, presentation back over, we appreciate it, Neil. Receptors, if you work in the field at all and you're an investigator in LSRP, pretty, no, pretty much know what a receptor is, but it is defined in the regulations as any human or ecological component, which is or may be affected by a contaminant from a uh, contaminated site. Um, some examples would be sensitive human ecological receptors, schools, special status, species habitats. You're going to, as I said earlier, know a lot of this information as you're going through the PASI, RI, RA process. So you, you know, you've got it available to evaluate. And uh, you know, for example, you know you've got contaminants contained behind a sheet piling, your site's on a waterfront. You also know the sheet pilings starting to decay, maybe one storm surge away from failing. Is that something, as part of your catastrophic event planning or thinking process, you want to make enhancements to that sheet piling before the next storm event happens and releases your contaminants into the nearby surface water? Um, I think we all should know, but maybe it's not that clear that you don't get a free pass when a catastrophic event occurs and causes a release or a discharge of contaminants at your site. You still need to make the notification to the department. Um, and not only do you have the contaminants of concern and areas of concern that you're aware of that you're trying to remediate, you may have remedial equipment on site that could also pose a risk of release and discharge during a catastrophic event. You know, for anticipated events, you can make certain changes on the fly at the last minute, but it's better to have a plan, and certainly for an unanticipated event. With no plan, you're, you're just that much more exposed. 
um, the damage that can come from a catastrophic event. These were my <clears throat> these were wells on a site I was working on. I was one of a couple of LSRPs associated with it, so they weren't my wells. But um, as you can see, the one on the left probably damaged beyond being usable. The one on the right, who knows where it came from? Uh, you know, so that increases your workload on the back end with respect to reinstalling wells or relocating them in the case of the one on the right. So site conditions will potentially change as a result of a catastrophic event. As I mentioned earlier, think in terms of the conceptual site model. This isn't a required submittal to the department. It's not a required document that you have to have. It's just good common sense and good practice. And uh, it could help make your life easier. And as I've said before, as you're going through the regulatory process, you're accumulating knowledge. You're not reinventing the wheel when it takes the information that you already have, receptor evaluation contaminants. You know these things probably by the remedial investigation stage. You might not know the extent of the problem. But you have this information, and you could start using it to prepare a, a catastrophic event plan. Now, the tension I personally see is clients saying, do I have to do it? Is there a regulatory requirement? And my response is going to be no. And he's going to say, well, I'm going to be you know, penny wise and pound foolish. So it, it's probably going to be a hard sell in some instances when you say it's going to cost you several thousand dollars or whatever it's going to cost to prepare a, a plan to deal with catastrophic events. But maybe one of the points to make is the further along you get, you're a businessman, you're trying to clean up this site, you've got an investment in it. The longer this goes on, the more the investment grows, the more you have at stake to lose if you don't prepare for a catastrophic event. Um, this again was that same site. And one of the things we touch on here is, is uh, you know, do you shut things down and move away in advance of uh, an anticipated event, or do you try to you know, work through it? Something like this was not critical to the site. It was a very useful piece of equipment. It's a frac tank, Adler tank, Baker tank, has different names, but basically it's for storing contaminated liquids, pumping out monitoring wells or surface water accumulations that are contaminated. And you're going to store it in the tank, and from time to time you're going to have the tank pumped off and the liquid's going to go out for disposal at a proper facility. Should you pump it off before the storm event? Should you get it then off the site completely? Because even after pumped out, you know, there's going to be some residual sludges in there, residual contamination. Uh, you know, my thought was lesson learned. I would have gotten this thing off the site because it slid several hundred feet and almost fell into the stream, which would have been, you know, another cost of remediation and another issue to deal with, another discharge notification to the department to deal with. Um, yeah, and, and a nearby site I had had monitoring wells that the creek overflowed, a lot of siltation happened after the storm, couldn't find the monitoring wells to begin with. And when we did, we didn't re-GPR them, or GPS them rather, and we took samples and we had the wells confused. So the well that had previously been non-detect had screaming levels of benzene and vice versa. So pre-planning may have helped a little bit with that also. You need to consider regulations in your plan. Um, you know, what's applicable, what may have requirements in and of themselves for some type of planning along these lines. And, uh, you know, your remedial work and then your catastrophic event recovery work may require special permits, such as emergency permits and waivers. Um, you know, the, the guidance document has lists of these, and I would refer you to that to get a better understanding. But, um, you know, remember that I think the governor issued several executive orders post Sandy, but they don't lay out there forever. Again, not carte blanche. There's constraints associated with them, so be aware of that. Okay, the guidance is intended to apply at any remedial stage, um, but in my experience, you're not going to have a lot of information at a preliminary assessment stage, unless maybe you're the LSRP or investigator working on behalf of a purchaser of an ISRA site that's got activities going on, and by virtue of the transaction arrangements, you're picking up some of those responsibilities or going to be maintaining certain site systems. 
So you may want to start thinking at that point about planning, but by and large, you're probably not going to have a lot of information to do your, your catastrophic event planning at the preliminary assessment stage. Thank you, Allison. I, was, I almost forgot to push the button and do the little graphics. Um, iterative process, as you go through, you're going to have more information. You're going to have more equipment possibly on a site, more things to protect. A little bit more at the site investigation stage. Certainly at the remedial investigation stage, you're probably going to have some amount of equipment on site. The monitoring wells I showed, things that you might want to protect and be prepared for a catastrophic event. As with the remedial action stage where you might have some serious uh, remedial equipment on site that you need to consider. And even post remedial action. Okay, so use all the information you've been developing during the remedial process to help in your planning and site system hardening. Uh, and, and with that, I'd like to introduce Nick Santello. He was a very hard worker on the committee and always a guy who was willing to step up. George? We're going to take uh, some questions. Oh, Please okay. make sure that Sorry we have any questions. That. Thank you. Nick is ready to go, though. I like that. You're very good. <coughs> yes. Uh, Anthony, do you want to open up the, uh, the webinar? Great. Ira Whitman, LSRP. Uh, this past winter, we had one gigantic snowstorm in New Jersey, and we had some advance notice. And if I remember right, DEP, the day before, it was on a Friday, the storm came on Saturday, issued a list serve, and correct me if I'm wrong on the details, having to do with possible loss of power and operating systems and so on. And in our firm, where there are half a dozen LSRPs or so, we, when we received that, the LSRPs got together and made a list and a determination of which of our clients we should notify with regard to the sub-slab systems, for example. Mm -hmm. okay, and that, that was very useful to us from DEP. It caused us to think about this type of uh, situation in advance that we probably wouldn't have thought about because everybody would have been saying, well, what time is it going to start to snow, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. that, but in the scheme of things, do you consider that to be a catastrophic uh, event where there's pretty good weather forecasting and it's pretty well known in advance that, that we're going to get slammed with such a storm? Uh, you know, I would, Mr. Whitman, um, in, the, in the context that I'm not going to split hairs over a definition. I'm going to say, as, as your firm did, you know, I got sites out there. I might lose power, even if it's for a few hours. If I've got a critical system, I want to do something about it. What am I going to do? Well, I've got an emergency generator on the site. I'm going to make sure that's working. I've got a fuel contract with a, you know, with some, with a vendor who supplies on a regular basis and hopefully on an emergency basis. I'm going to make sure the things that I think I have in place are ready to go. So whether it really fits the definition that I showed earlier and is in the guidance, the, the more important thing is make sure your, your sites are secured to the extent that they can be. And if you have plans, if you've got an emergency notification network, make sure the guy that's supposed to be in charge of some aspect isn't on vacation that week and nobody knows about it. I would uh, actually add to that, uh, Ira, we had a tremendous number of conversations within the committee in regard to that. And it almost came up that catastrophic events are severe, severe enough that they certainly impact your system operation, uh, the equipment you have on site. And so I think what we wanted to do in, in this particular document was to at least advise people and recommend that they prepare for that. When, when a listserv comes out from the department stating you know, that, hey, something's coming down the road, you might want to be prepared, our kind of point of view was you should already be prepared, but now you're starting to think and, and maybe bring up that plan that you have and say, all right, what do we need to do? And most of the things are already pre-planned, and you just select the ones that you really need to implement. And so I think that was our, our idea, is that most of the hard work, most of the legwork is already done, and you're just making final adjustments on what you need to do. We're also going to talk a little bit later within um, the presentation of some of the decision trees and, and charts that we have where you kind of decide how severe a, or how likely uh, a catastrophic event is and how you would plan for that. So that's a very good question. Let's take one from the webinar that says there's a lot of background noise, and this is from uh, Elizabeth Limbrick. Uh, I think the Q&A microphones have been picking up audience conversations. Actually, Elizabeth, we have checked on that. 
Uh, none of our microphones are actually set up except for the Q&A microphones, and they have both been off. And so we're not sure exactly where that is. We think perhaps Neil is wired, and uh, <laughs> he's a mole, and he's picking up noise. No, just kidding, Neil. Uh, so the idea is we're not sure where that is coming from. We have been checking on it, but it's definitely not any of the microphones we're using. Uh, any other questions from the audience? Oh, we have one in the back here. Bill Snitcherling. Uh, Neil, for the catastrophic event, how is that covered with insurance in, in your experience? Because we all have the T's and C's on, on our contracts that nobody except the uh, accountants read. But if it's a catastrophic event, that would be an act of God. And sometimes the cost with that act of God, the, the, the what happens because of the act of God are not our responsibility, the client's responsibility, and not, they're out of our budget. Well, I think that's that's sort of a separate issue, Bill, from you know the idea of being prepared and planning for having contingencies in place and having a communication network, all the things that we talk about in the guidance. We did discuss, actually, and it was in and out and in and out, some some items associated with uh, financial assurance and, and mechanisms to uh, financially, if you will, be prepared. And I, I personally had some issues with that because there are regulatory requirements, there are you know, remediation funding sources and financial assurance mechanisms that are in place. We didn't want to start treading into that area. And as far as insurance, I think it was beyond the scope of this. You know, hopefully your client has insurance. If he doesn't, you know, caveat emptor. And I think also the, as far as the, the financial aspect of it, we were trying to stay away from that because that opens up a whole other area of discussion and the document would be a lot thicker. Uh, our, our thoughts were that there is a lot of value for an LSRP or anyone, any environmental consultant, to advise their client and to help them better prepare so that during an event, perhaps like Superstorm Sandy, that the loss would be much, much less, would be reduced because of your pre-action. And I think that's really what our intent was. Anybody else? Any other questions? We have none on the web. Okay, great. You can close the web out. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you very much, Neil. Excellent job. And again, next up, we'd like to uh, introduce Nicholas Antilla. Nick? Thank you. Uh, my name is Nick Santella. I am a hydrogeologist with BSTI. I'm actually in our PA office, but I do a lot of work doing technical support for R and other LSRPs. So I'm very familiar, sometimes painfully familiar, with the uh, guidance documents that are out there. Um, I'll explain a little bit how I got here. I've got a background of maybe eight years or so um, in environmental consulting and remediation work, starting out um, at HydroQual in Mawa, New Jersey. Um, and then with BSTI, but somewhere in the middle of those eight years, I spent three and a half years working in academic research on the subject of emergency management. Um, and that work focused heavily on the impact of natural disasters on the chemical and petroleum industry, um, focused heavily on the Gulf Coast uh, events like Hurricane Rita and Katrina, which had uh, big impacts on those industries, very difficult to recover from, and some significant uh, releases as a result of them. So that's a perspective that I tried to bring to this guidance document. So that said, Neil um, explained there's a, a really wide variety of hazards that this is attempting to address. Um, and because of that wide variety, it's difficult to plan for them all. Uh, this document isn't suggesting that you look at these different hazards and then prepare for each one individually. Rather, it's suggesting that you look at that full range of hazards, assess the risk associated with them at your individual site, and then try to plan um, to make sure that your site continues to function effectively and is relatively resilient in the face of a catastrophic event. And a really easy example of this is in communications. It doesn't matter whether you're preparing to communicate um, in the case of a hurricane or a flood or a fire, the same types of preparations will be required in each case. Um, knowing that you're going to prepare, uh, 
the question is, how do you prepare? So uh, this flowchart was an attempt to explain um, under what conditions you um, might want to prepare in what way. Um, so the easiest uh, distinction to make is between sites where there's an RAO um, and where there is not. So this guidance document is not trying to make you go back to a closed site and do a bunch of planning for it in the case of a catastrophic event. So we're not making any recommendations um, about preparation in that case where there is an RAO, either for the whole site or for an individual AOC. Um, but in the case where there is not an RAO, um, the next question that you'll ask yourself is whether there are potential receptors either under current conditions or the conditions that may occur um, in a catastrophic event. Um, and if the answer to that is no, then you have a little bit less impetus to plan, but we're still recommending that you do some kind of assessment um, of the probability of impacts to your site and the risk that may be associated with that. Um, after you've done that assessment, and it could be very simple sitting down for half an hour and just thinking through different scenarios, um, you can make a decision based on whether there are significant impacts. If they're not, you don't really need to do a lot of planning. You can simply update your contact list, make sure you know who to call if there's a new release or some other um, problematic conditions during a catastrophic event, and just go on. Um, if there is a probability of some significant impacts, you do a little bit more planning. You know, coordinate with other people on the site, uh, maybe write something down, think about what mitigation you could put into place. Um, really, it's the same process if there are potential receptors. Um, you're just doing a little bit more of everything, trying a little bit harder. You may want to document your um, analysis and what types of mitigations you can make a little more thoroughly. It's a little more important to have them down in writing. Um, and then uh, in the case that there may be significant impacts um, at a site with receptors, um, you're just doing everything to a little bit of a higher level. Um, it may be that mitigation needs to be put into place, um, and it may be that uh, at a high impact site, this is the type of assessment that really a uh, investigator might might not do on their own, but uh, hire um, someone else to do a detailed engineering analysis, for example. Um, that said, how to plan. Obviously, if you have an RAO, you don't need to do anything. Um, if you don't, What's recommended is the same basic process for all sites, as I kind of outlined, to look at everything that's going on at the site, both activities and uh, equipment related to remediation. We're not talking about uh, other site operations if it's, say, an active industrial facility. Um, evaluate the hazards that may affect the site. Look at the risk that may result from those hazards, either financial or environmental. Um, and identify some mitigation measures and see if you can implement them and document that all in some kind of response plan. So this is one example of how you can do that assessment. Um, this is a pretty standard way of looking at risk, a risk matrix, um, and down the side vertically is the probability of an event occurring, um, whether it's an annual storm that you can be pretty much guaranteed will happen every year, or it's an extreme hurricane or earthquake that may happen less than once every thousand years. You can you look at the data for your site, and there's lots of data out there, see how probable different types of events are at your site. Um, the next step along the top is looking at the consequences of, of that event for your site. Whether there will be just a minor disruption, the power goes out for 15 minutes, say, or whether there will be some very serious level of damage. Um, and this is a stripped down version of what's in the guidance document just to make it easier to read. But for each of these items where hazard is described um, in the guidance document, it also goes into the types of effects that that hazard may have on your site. So this is just a way of really putting together a conceptual model, basically, of catastrophic events at your site. 
um, then you use this to uh, make a judgment call on whether so this is something that you need to prepare for or not. And that's what's illustrated in the color coding. The green things are relatively minor impacts, um, so you're not going to specifically plan for them. The things that are highlighted in red are uh, relatively serious impacts that are probably worth thinking more about mitigating. Um, and in orange or yellow are the things that are such a low probability um, that really there's no point in specifically planning for them. Uh, but it's worth pointing out that even if you are planning for these kind of mid-range of events, um, it will make your life go easier uh, in a small storm, say, where the power goes out for a couple of hours, and it will help to mitigate damage in a larger catastrophic event that you may not have explicitly planned for. So this is another example of a way of organizing your assessment of the risk to your site. This is an example from an EPA guidance document on uh, natural hazard risk to pump and treat remediation systems, and it's referenced in the appendix of the guidance document. Um, this is just a small excerpt from it, but it illustrates that down the side you have all the different types of remedial components um, from a remediation system across the top are the types of damage that may occur or the, the hazards that may result in damage. And there's an assessment done shown in the open and black circles as to which of these um, in the judgment of the investigator are of most concern and therefore worth attempting to mitigate. And you know, along the side are some examples of mitigation, like having backup power, having remote access, another good example that a lot of people uh, or sorry, they did not do after Sandy, is elevating electrical equipment. Um, that background said, I'll just highlight some of the resources that are in Appendix B of the guidance document. We just tried to uh, highlight some different um, tools that can be used to assess the risk at a site. Some of them people are probably pretty familiar with, some of them they may not have seen. Uh, the most obvious is FEMA flood maps. This is an example of a site in a coastal area. Um, it illustrates that there's a parking lot at the back of this facility that might look like a good place to plant some remediation equipment. But if you look at the FEMA flood map, you can see that um, in the case of a hurricane, it's going to be in a uh, flood zone affected by storm surge. And these things are really easy to find online. You may look at them for other regulatory purposes, but it's worth just checking them out for all of your sites. This is another example of a flood mapping tool. This is a website from Rutgers. It lets you look at FEMA flood zones, uh, modeled storm surge from different categories of hurricanes. It lets you also view the storm surge inundation from Hurricane Sandy. Um, it includes actually some uh, additional things related to sea level rise. Uh, this is just an illustration of a portion of Jersey City and what it would look like um, in a Category 2 hurricane. Uh, two of the points that are worth making about this are one that it's actually a very handy feature that this illustrates the depth of storm surge inundation, not just the zone that's inundated because uh, the deeper the inundation and the faster the flood water moves, uh, the more likely you are to have damage um, and potential for environmental releases. Um, and this is also to highlight the fact that it's not just about inundation. If an area is cut off by flood waters, that also very severely limits um, the types of actions you can take at a site. Um, one more hazard uh, that people may not often think about in New Jersey. Um, there's actually significant uh, wildfire risk, especially in the Pinelands area. Um, and this is an interactive uh, PDF map that's available on the NJDP website. Um, and it was helpfully pointed out by uh, Gary, who's going to be up next, that uh, there was a recent Rolling Stone article about this risk and that uh, it actually could be pretty serious. Um, it's focused on the Pinelands, but not exclusive to it. And it's definitely worth thinking about if you have a remediation site in South Jersey.
Okay, this is a, another opportunity for the webinar audience to let us know that they are paying attention and on board. The question here for the webinar quiz is Rolling Stone Magazine wrote an article that described an apocalypse that could impact New Jersey. This apocalypse was, and the options are, a tsunami from the Azor Island landslide, wildfire in the Pinelands, or nuclear reactor meltdown at Oyster Creek. So again, we we're just, uh, just opened up no, nope, we have it open now, so webinar audiences, please uh, chime in. And uh, we will pull the audience in-house because they are all paying attention and they are sharp as tacks. So who thinks that it is number A or letter A? How about B? Just checking. Someone's sleeping in the back there. How about uh, C? Okay, so... I will once again say that most of the people in the audience had an answer there. I'm sorry, I'm just harping on one DEP person that I know who did not raise his hand. Just wanted to make sure he was awake. Uh, so we have 97% have voted. That means 3% are still sleeping. And I think we got 97% on the other one. So we're at 50. We're getting there. We'll dance, we'll get there. 54, 55, 56, 57, 58, 59. Okay, we can close that. And thank you guys in the audience, uh, in-house audience, for uh, your patience in doing this. It's a, it's a requirement. So just so that you know what the answer is, especially for the webinar audience, because occasionally they ask, just hit the forward button. One more time. And the answer is B, wildfire in the Pinelands. And actually, that is a real uh, threat. I've actually been involved in one of those wildfires, and uh, they're pretty scary uh, to be part of. Okay, so continue. Nicholas, thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Um, and I'll just add that that East Coast tsunami thing is a real thing, but it's a perfect example of the kind of thing that you're probably not going to be preparing for. I mean, a 60-foot tsunami may wipe out the entire East Coast, but it may be once every million years. So that's probably not on the time frame that you're going to be worrying about at a remediation site. Um, that said, uh, once you've identified the risks that you are going to worry about, um, what are you going to do about them? Uh, and I'll just highlight a couple of defensive and adaptive measures, and I'd love to hear uh, people shout out some other ones that uh, they think are worthwhile. Um, one example is uh, stabilization of soils. Um, it's something that you may need to do anyway for sediment erosion control purposes, prevent redistribution of contaminants either on your site or to other sites in the case of catastrophic event. Um, another is securing remedial equipment. It's something very basic, you know, bolt down your product recovery tank, uh, tie down your remediation trailer, things that it may be easy to skip if you're not thinking about them. Uh, don't leave drums lying around where they can wash away. Um, another one, as I pointed out, that was big after Sandy is the elevation of electrical equipment. Uh, don't put it in the basement if you can help it. Put it above the base flood elevation. Look at the FEMA website to know what the base flood elevation is. Um, and last is kind of the, the big one, structural defenses. Um, and those may not be very applicable to remediation sites. You may not need to put a six-foot high berm around your site. Um, but there may be select cases where it is. Um, and so you should consider that too. Um, next, I'm going to talk about communication. And this slide is here just to emphasize the fact that uh, this picture is not the time to be thinking about communication. You need to be thinking about it ahead of time. And this is sort of a joke, but it's also very true. I know I am not an emergency responder. I don't get out much really at all. But this has happened to me twice, where I've been standing in front of a burning remediation site and calling my office trying to get a hold of the right person. In one case, I neglected to take the hasp with the contact numbers with me when I rapidly exited the burning building. In another case, the only contact number for the property owner in the HASPs was the phone in the burning building. Um, and that is a relatively easy mistake to make. I, I don't think I wrote that HASP, but I'm not sure. Um, the point is uh, that when you're going to communicate during a 
catastrophic event, it's probably about something important. So you need to be able to do it quickly um, and with a certain degree of assurance. Um, obviously, phone is the preferred method of communication, but it's important to have a bunch of redundant methods, um, not just office numbers, but cell phone numbers, home numbers, landline numbers, email, Facebook, whatever you can do to get a hold of people when you have to. Um, that could include things like having a meeting location um, in case your office or the site is inaccessible um, and having uh, the contact numbers for all the types of first responder uh, that you might or notifications that you may need to have readily available in multiple locations um, and also all the right contacts at the site um, not just the person that you deal with for mediation but owners tenants um, facility managers in the case of active facilities and that, again that's really important in the case of active facilities where in an emergency the person in charge um, may be somebody that you've never even heard of. Um, also supplies. This is a very uh, site specific consideration but it's something that's worth um, sitting down and again thinking about beforehand. Um, it may be that you need some basic spill response supplies in a shed at your site. Um, you may need something completely different. Um, but whatever it is that you need, write it down after you've thought about it um, and keep an inventory if you're keeping equipment or resources on the site. It's also important to have uh, contractor information readily available, especially since it may be uh, difficult to get a hold of contractors in the aftermath of a catastrophic event. Um, for example, electricians will be in high demand and you may not be able to get somebody to hook your system back up um, just with a simple phone call. Pre-contracting um, for the event of emergency can help with that. Um, and also having the contact information for local emergency responders. You usually have the fire department's number in a HASP, um, but it's not just in case you have a fire, the local emergency responders, as Gary will talk about in more detail, um, are the right people to call um, if you have other needs. For example, you need to get a fuel truck uh, to your site to be able to refuel a generator to prevent a release. Um, if it's a priority, you can contact the locals um, and get an escort or get a direct assistance with fuel if necessary. Um, and uh, I will just... Great. Thank you very much, questions. Nicholas. Excellent job. Uh, we'll uh, take questions. If you can open up the uh, webinar questions, Anthony, we appreciate it. Do you have uh, any questions in the in-house audience? We do not. You must have really covered that well. Let's see. Do we have any on the webinar? Now we'll give it just a couple seconds because it takes a while to uh, submit those. And if not, we will move on to, to Gary. Oh, we do have... Bill has a question. William Buchanan, uh, SRP, DEP. I just had noted that one of the really weak links uh, in this, in any emergency, seems to be cell phones, with both cell phone towers having their own problems, but actually cell phone congestion uh, being something that you can actually, you would like to contact people, but you cannot and that uh, I've kind of moved to at least trying to have some alternatives uh, and just say, well, maybe I won't have cell phone uh, ability to contact these people. How else am I going to uh, basically uh, work this? Because uh, it, it may just be something that cell phones will not be available for hours or even a day or something like that, depending upon what the, uh, the situation was. Yeah, that's exactly the point that we're trying to make. Just ahead of time, it's easy to collect that information. Um, I'll also add that sometimes text messages will go through when you can't make a cell phone call. Bill, I just wanted to add to that. Uh, cell phones really haven't been much of a problem since the World Trade Center. I've worked a lot of emergencies since then, and cell phone coverage has been pretty good, except when the World Trade Center and the cell towers on top of that fell down. But also, Ed, you know, when power went out, uh, a lot of people found out that the old rotary dial phones worked when the other touch tone or ones that you actually had to plug in did not. So I think, again, the, it's, it's worth the effort of going and thinking, well, what other options could you possibly communicate with 
if you did not have the ability to, to use uh, the ones that are most readily available uh, regularly. So I think that's it. We have no more webinar questions. Okay, so I'll uh, introduce uh, Gary Pearson. Uh, Gary, if you give the people just an idea of your area of expertise. Sure, I'm Gary Pearson. I'm the Assistant Director in Emergency Management. I've been here for about, in Emergency Management for about 20 years now. Prior to that, I started DP in the mid uh, 80s at Barnett Light State Park, where I had the distinct pleasure every day of walking to the top of the lighthouse and making sure there was no dead bodies there when we closed the park and coming back the next morning and doing the same thing. I left uh, Barnett Light and went and worked in the petrochemical industry for uh, three or four years and was blessed to come back to DEP and work in uh, field operations and emergency response ever since. Uh, the emergency management program in DEP used to be part of SRP. Uh, three or four years ago, we moved over working directly for the deputy commissioner. Emergency management is composed of two programs, the Bureau of Emergency Response, where we have two uh, regional offices, one in Cedar Knowles and one here in the Ewing area, uh, where uh, they're primarily has materials responders, but they're trained to respond to all hazards. We also have another Bureau, the Bureau of Communications and Response Services, which is located in Hamilton with the uh, State Police Troop C headquarters, which maintains the DEP's 24-hour uh, communication center. So if you call the hotline, our folks answer that and hopefully route it to the right part of DEP. Uh, the other part thing Emergency Imagine does is we will coordinate within DEP all of the various program emergency response coordinators and the DEP's response to uh, large emergencies with the State Police Office of Emergency Management. Um, most folks may know that in New Jersey it's unique. State Police are in charge of emergency management. Uh, there's only one other state that works that way. So I'm going to yes. talk about training first. Uh, one of the things you need to make sure is the folks that you have responding are trained to the appropriate level. We had an incident a couple of weeks ago out on Route 80 where we had a motor vehicle accident involving a leaking diesel salad tank. And it seemed like everything was going great. The uh, towing vendor had all the tools and supplies they needed, and their personnel were out there putting speedy dry on the road, sweeping it up, containing or removing all the oil. And uh, OSHA stopped by and asked the uh, towing vendor about the level of training his employees had. And when he mentioned that they had no level of training and he didn't really know what the uh, – OSHA regulations for cleaning up an oil spill where things stop and we had to move in a new direction. So your personnel who are going to be responsible for implementing a response need to have the appropriate level of training. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about NIMS, but I'm getting ahead of myself. The other thing about training is you also need to make sure that the folks, the training is caught, that they actually can do what they were trained to do. So you need to have exercises and possibly run a tabletop. Make sure they really did learn something during the training. And one of the things you're going to learn is that emergencies are managed in a system called NIMS, National Incident Management System. Uh, I'm not going to teach NIMS today, but I just want you to be aware of it. I'm going to say that's how you're going to get resources from government at your sites. NIMS was developed, at, contrary to what the slide says, by the uh, Wildfire Service. Folks out in Idaho who manage large-scale wildfires realized years back that they had a problem coordinating firefighters at fires, and they developed a modular uh, common approach to managing incidents that's been adopted nationwide. Uh, one of the things George Bush does, he forces on all federal agencies. Our federal partners in Coast Guard and EPA are using it regularly. They use it for planned and non-planned events. On the FEMA website, there's a level... IS 700 course, that's a awareness. It would be really useful for your folks who might have to deal with uh, catastrophic events to have taken that course. I think it's two and a half hours long. It's all uh, web-based, but it gives the overall view of what uh, the emergency responders are thinking and how they uh, plan for events. The thing that uh, you probably won't get from that training is the National Response Framework uh, basically says, Incidents start at the local level, go to the county, to the state, and then to the federal level. So if you have an event at a uh, site you're responsible for and you need resources, as Nick mentioned earlier, whether it's fuel, escorts, uh, you need a generator. Your site's isolated, and if, the, if your generator goes out or has gone out and you're going to have a release that will be uncontrolled, 
that's the way you get those resources. You would reach out to the local office of emergency management. If they can't assist you, they'll reach out to the county and it'll cascade up until either the resource is available or somebody comes back and tells you you're, you're out of luck. But they will reach out all the way up through the federal level. Thing to remember, regardless of what's going on, is safety first. Uh, as the fire service says, everybody goes home alive. Uh, you don't want your folks getting hurt on a response to a contaminated site. We need to think about the activity level at a site, which will determine the nature of the response. A vacant lot will determine less of a response than a site with a treatment system that may be failing. You need to think about the relationship of the site or an AOC to the facility where it's located at, or is it at a facility? Is it at a closed facility? If it's at a facility, you need to understand who's in charge. You may be in charge of the remediation you're conducting, but as uh, Neil said, there may be a record contingency plan, which will be the overall guidance document on how a response occurs at that site. You may be at a site where there are no plans in your uh, response plan for your issues may be the only plan that covers that site. At that point, you may need to make sure you're coordinating well with the uh, local officials. You need to understand who, if there was an emergency at your site, who would be in charge. In New Jersey, it's generally the uh, local fire chief. It might be worthwhile if you have a site to go in and introduce yourself to and build a relationship with them. Uh, this is a picture I always love. Uh, as you can tell, there's a, it happens to be a fire truck there. It's a large tank in England that was on fire. A whole bunch of issues. The point of the slide is don't put your folks at risk if this is your site. You need to understand who is in charge. At this point, it's probably not the person responsible for the remediation. You may want to get on site and integrate yourself into the incident command system that's set up under NIMS and get in the background and be available to assist because your remediation may have some effect on the fire. We talked about anticipated versus unanticipated events earlier. Uh, when an anticipated event is imminent, you need to assess the site conditions and the threat that's from the event. Review your planning documents. Hope you have them, you're ready to get into action, and you, you should have procedures in place that you need to consider implementing. Uh, but you need to also be in a safe place. The, the event may be imminent. You may want to test your comms. Uh, you may need to know who from your first, uh, organization is responding and where they're going to be coming from. You may need to work on coordinating your plan with the facility, if it's a facility. Again, if not it's a facility, local fire chief, local officer of emergency management. You need to think about can you or should you get to the site. I don't know why there's a question. I have another slide. Yeah, just to continue through that, that might have been uh, inserted accidentally there. Because I think you have a couple more slides. Yeah, I did. Yeah. Sorry. We'll just take it after that. Uh, this is a, a picture of some of my staff sent to me in uh, June of 2006. We had a uh, tropical low with heavy rains causing massive flooding, uh, mostly along the Delaware. And we were tasked with going up to make sure a uh, remediation at a circle site was in safe hands. Uh, should we have continued on at this point? That's a sewer pipe that's breached. Uh, raw sewage was in the excavation. Uh, it's not excavation. That's where the road used to be. The trees were going towards the site. My guy smartly turned around and decided to wait till we had some more intel before trying to go up there. Personal safety was a priority. You need to prioritize your response actions. You need to come with the higher, in our minds, of conditions requiring response. Do you have emergency response conditions at the site? Do you need to get out there and actually get something underway? Are there IEC, immediate environmental concern conditions? Is that going to cause problems? immediately or down the road. Is the contaminants on site contained to the site? You need to be uh, understanding of what your site is going to do, be doing to your neighbors. Can you keep your stuff on site? Do you have runoff? Do you have dust? Do you have smoke? Liquids are going to leave the site. Is it staying? Can you keep it there? Again, all this says is you need to have plans. You need to practice, test, evaluate, and review your plans. I must have a uh, thing about fires. I was flying into San Juan, Puerto Rico, and this is a uh, fuel facility outside the airport that was fully involved in fire. Uh, there's also, there were several ongoing remediations that were being overseen by EPA. Bunch of issues. They couldn't keep the contaminants on site. This plume was going across the island of Puerto Rico. There was discharges from multiple tanks on site. 
uh, and there's a lot of personal risk. You need to th prioritize the sites you have. I'm assuming a lot of you folks have more than one site. You probably have multiple areas of concern. Uh, those places have multiple risks. This is a concrete pad at a uh, former uh, uh, plant that processed uh, uh, meat. They would, uh, they, uh, I just forgot the word. There's a place in Newark that they process meat into other products. There were, at one point, there were three tons of rotting meat sitting on that concrete slab. I think this concrete slab's risk was eliminated now. It's probably low risk, low priority. Same site where the abandoned drums are also on site during a planning for an event. That kind of gives you a little bit more priority. It's a large uh, portion of the lower part of Bayonne where it's multiple risks. You have those various sites. You have an anticipated event. You need to look at the risk and decide which ones are you going to be more concerned about and how you're going to deal with your limited resources. You also need to think about should you and can you respond? Do you have the trained personnel and resources you need? Who is the right person to respond? What is the appropriate level of training that person should have? You have to also think about do you actually have those resources? Uh, is your fuel supplier actually going to be available to you? Is your emergency response contractor also the guy who's working for all your neighboring sites? Do you have a commitment from him? Is he more committed to other facilities or other sites? Uh, we had during Hurricane Sandy, and this is not a uh, contaminated site, we had a large egg layer, uh, 380,000 chickens in a several barns in Monmouth County. They were on a uh, backup generator for about a week when they realized their fuel supplier was not going to be able to make the fuel deliveries. If you don't have fuel and you don't have electricity at a laying, laying facility, all the chickens die. They reached out to their local OEM coordinator who assisted with them in getting fuel to keep that facility going so we didn't have 380,000 dead chickens in Monmouth County during Hurricane Sandy. You also need to think about how you get access to the site. Uh, if you don't have a relationship with your local OEM coordinator or your local fire chief, the locals may not let you on site. They may not, regardless of what you say to them, have any reason to let you into an area that you may need to get to. After the response, you need to think through the recovery. Uh, you need to think about getting the site back to the operational condition it was in before. You want to get back to your pre-event conditions. Have you documented your pre-event conditions? Can you show what the site looked like prior to the event? Do you know, as Neil uh, discovered, where your wells are? Uh, can you uh, identify what activities occurred on your site, and did they have an effect on your neighbors? You may not have been there when the, uh, during the event. You may not have any idea of what actually happened. Uh, for example, DEP owns a pheasant farm. Uh, we have a large pheasant farm up in Port Murray, New Jersey. We had a huge snow event that took out all the cages that hold the pheasants and all the pheasants escaped. FEMA didn't want to pay the DEP for the loss in the pheasant farm until we pulled out the images showing the number of pheasants in the fenced areas and the cages that were now all destroyed. This may look like a home heating oil at a residential site. This uh, residence adjoined a uh, fuel facility in, uh, it was in Atlantic County. And uh, during another catastrophic winter event, the fuel facility lost uh, hundreds of gallons of red dyed uh, home heating oil, which they appear to be using in uh, trucks, but that's another issue. But by the time they were able to get back to their fuel facility where the reme ongoing remediation was occurring, this was gone. The local residents said this came from your site, uh, and they were able to show that it was the facility and not them. Something to think about uh, is new technologies and guidance. We talk about that a lot during the committee activities. Uh, you should use the most current and applicable rules. And now is an opportunity after the event to update your media systems. Post-event reporting. Events may cause a new release, uh, and that may uh, require the notification of the department. Uh, that could trigger regulatory uh, requirements. As a lot of you know, I'm sure, as the Site Remediation Reform Act has several exemptions on when a DEP is going to be involved in a site. If the Bureau of Emergency Response or a County Environmental Health Act agency working for the Bureau of Emergency Response 
uh, comes out to a new release, they're going to be the lead until they determine the emergency is over. They may direct the RP to hire an LSRP, among other things, or they may tell the RP that they need to do a scope of work and complete that scope of work before they allow the LSRP to return and take over that site again. And this may be occurring at a site that an LSRP is controlling or is already dealing with other remedial actions there. Once the uh, Bureau of Emergency Response or the County Environmental Health Act agency is done, they would then refer to back to SRP for appropriate case assignment, and hopefully it would come back with the same LSRP, but that would be up to the responsible party. One of the important things to do after an event is to gather lessons learned. Uh, you, need to you may need to modify the planning process. You may need to modify your response based on those lessons learned. Uh, conducting a post-mortem where you gather all the important uh, uh, players, the local officials, the response contractors, and get their perspective on what occurred and what you can do better in the future is critical in improving your planning and being prepared for the next response. You then update your plan, and now you've updated. You may want to exercise that plan. You may want to run a tabletop. You may want to run a functional exercise to make sure that the lessons learned actually caught. And then again, you review your plan. Now that's the question slide that came up earlier. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much, Gary. Appreciate that. Uh, we'll now take uh, questions. Anthony, if you could open up uh, questions for the webinar. Do you have any uh, questions in-house? We do not. I would uh, say, though, one of the uh, slides that you had up there in regard to lessons learned, I think that's really what this committee was. This committee was kind of as a result of Superstorm Sandy, and a lot of the lessons that were learned during that event translated into this guidance, and that's what most of the discussions that we were involved in were part of what happened during that event, what did we do wrong, what can we do better, and the guidance kind of reflects a lot of that information. Yeah. Okay, we have no questions, so we're going to... Oh. Right. Uh, Tessie's reminding me that we do have a green evaluation form. I apologize for not pointing that out in the very beginning. We do take those kind of seriously and improve every presentation that we have. So again, during this uh, uh, program, if you would please uh, keep that kind of at the top of your list there. And as we go along, uh, complete that, and we will collect them at the end. Also, people in the webinar, you have the ability to download the evaluation form from the list of documents, and we would appreciate it if you did that and I gave us some feedback. We do have uh, something here from Neil. Neil? Gary, can you just go back to uh, what I'm showing is slide 72? I'm not sure I can. What was the title on it, Neil? Because mine aren't numbers. New technologies. Okay. Thank you. At the bottom of that slide, we have opportunity to update remedial systems. In, in context, remember that you might have an approved remedial action work plan. So to start changing what's already been approved or documented or agreed to with the DEP, um, don't just do something on the fly because you've got a post-event opportunity to make some changes. That's the only point I wanted to make. But at the same time, you might want to relocate your electrical systems because they flooded because they were in the basement. Right. I think the other thing, some of the discussions during the committee was the fact that from the time you implemented that system and made that remedial decision, <clears throat> perhaps that technology has improved from the fact that you could implement something much more efficient or more effective. But Neil's point is very well taken. That that does not mean that you can do that without notifying the department, without submitting additional uh, remedial action work plan updates. Thank you. Okay. Now we're going to go into a uh, case study. So uh, again, we're going to have uh, Nicholas Santella come up and finish this out with the case study. So Nick. Thank you. We're coming into the home stretch. So this case study is to try to pull together all these parts um, and illustrate how they might work in real life. This example um, is going to be focused on flood risk, partially because this whole guidance document came out of Hurricane Sandy, but all the concepts um, are large, and a lot of the mitigation actions that are going to be illustrated are largely applicable to all sorts of other hazards, whether that's a fire, um, whatever, train derailment. Um, I'm going to start out um, by pointing out Appendix B, or sorry, Appendix A in the guidance document, which is a uh, 
a sort of countdown schedule for a predicted event. And this obvious example is a hurricane, but it could be other weather events uh, like winter storms. Um, and the purpose of this is partially to uh, serve as a template if you think this would be a useful thing for one of your sites, um, but also to illustrate that you need to start taking action uh, well ahead of time. So you need to be aware of these things uh, many days out. Uh, once you start hearing weather reports, um, you need to start reviewing your plans once um, it gets a little bit closer, and you need to actually start implementing um, whatever mitigation you're going to um, at least a day or two ahead of time. It's not uh, the right time when a hurricane's actually bearing down and the winds are picking up to try to start moving things around. So this a hy purely hypothetical example is a remediation site, which is also an active industrial facility on the Manasquan River. Um, it has two major areas of contamination. One is PCB impacted soils, and the other is soils and groundwater impacted by VOCs from operations at the site. Um, in this case, uh, remediation for the VOCs is currently taking place and is going to extend over a couple of years uh, with an ASSV system. Um, and the PCBs have been characterized, but there is no remediation planned in the near future. Uh, this is an illustration of what the site looks like. You can see that a portion of the site facilities and both of the areas of remediation are located in the 100-year FEMA flood zones. Um, they're below, obviously, the base flood elevation for the site. Um, there's also a stormwater detention basin on the site. And uh, some portion of the site, which is above both the 100 and 500 year flood elevations. So based on those site conditions, the investigator did an informal uh, risk assessment as we discussed using those types of tools we talked about and determined that the ASSV system is significantly vulnerable to uh, extreme weather hazards, that the system isn't tied down, it's in a flood zone, high winds or uh, significant flooding could create significant damage which would set the remediation back uh, by a significant period of time and also cost a lot of money. Um, at the same time, because of the topography, those PCB impacted soils are also potentially vulnerable to erosion in a heavy rain event. So the question is, given those conditions and that assessment, how can you mitigate that risk? Um, this is an illustration of the type of risk we're talking about. This is a, another picture from one of Neil's sites of a, I believe it's an office trailer, um, that was moved uh, several feet off of those concrete block foundation um, during Hurricane Sandy with a lot of damage, and I have similar pictures of remediation trailers with floodwater lines on them. So that's the kind of thing that you're trying to mitigate here. Um, an assessment was made and it was determined that the best way to mitigate this risk would be to, in the case of a predicted um, weather event, move the mobile portions of the remediation system to higher ground, to a couple of days ahead of time, disconnect everything, shut it down, um, and then tie it down in the uphill portion of that site. Um, in addition, they decided that it might be helpful for flood mitigation to drain the detention basin that's already there and make a number of other improvements, um, repairs to the bulkhead, uh, additional soil stabilization in the transformer area, and uh, perhaps most importantly, signing up key personnel who will be responsible for that, these activities for uh, weather alerts so that they're aware of these impending weather events ahead of time. And there's a lot of third-party services where you can get NOAA weather alerts either by text or email. Um, and you know, many cell phones now have emergency alerts as well built in. 
um, we are now imagining that this mitigation plan gets tested by a tropical storm in this year. Um, and in this case, the uh, ASSV system was successfully moved um, by the personnel who were supposed to do it because they had the information ahead of time. The basin was drained. Um, despite these preparations, there was some damage to the portions of the remediation system that stayed in place, um, but it's minor compared to what would have occurred if the trailer hadn't been moved. Um, there was some redistribution of contaminated soils, um, localized, um, but again, because the soils had been stabilized, it's not as bad as it could have been. Um, however, because of the uh, loss of communication systems in the closure of both the site and the investigator's office. The LSRP was not aware of the conditions of the site until several days afterwards, so that slowed down the response. And because of the types of constraints um, on contractors, the system didn't get hooked back up, repaired, and running uh, for about a month. So while that all worked reasonably well, it could have worked better. Um, and that is where the last step of evaluating the response and implementing changes based on your lessons learned comes in. Um, in this case, they decided that the relocation of the remediation trailer worked well. Um, they're not ready to expedite the remediation of the PCB impacted soils, um, but they're going to try further hardening um, those soils using different methodologies um, they also put some contracts in place to try to speed up uh, bringing the system back up um, if the same thing happens again and improve their contact list uh, with more redundant phone numbers, um, specifically home contact information for some of the key personnel um, if offices are closed. Um, and having that remote access uh, was useful. Okay, this is the opportunity and perhaps the last opportunity for the webinar audience to make sure that they are eligible for their CECs with the webinar question. And the question is, in the Tropical Storm Janine scenario, one of the lessons learned was that the SCADA system was a valuable asset. And so that is a true or false question. And we would appreciate the webinar audience chiming in on the answer to that. And we appreciate the patience once again of the in-house audience. And we're going to pull the in-house audience because they are all paying attention. And to my knowledge, looking around the room, they are all awake, which is great. So we're going to say, how many think that that answer is true? Like I said, they're all awake. Okay. How many think that it is false? Okay, I will confirm once again for the webinar audience that everyone is awake and sharp as a tack still in the room because they all got that correct. And we will show the correct uh, answer as soon as we close out the poll. So again, for the webinar audience, this will be the last question uh, in today's program. 96% have uh, chimed in. 4% <laughs> have the wrong answer. I mean, 4% have also chimed in on the false answer. We have uh, 10 more seconds to go. Counting down. 8, 9. Great. Let's close that out. And I will... Uh, Tell the webinar audience that the answer to that, and everyone in the room had it correct, is uh, true, that the SEADA system did uh, help in communications, and uh, therefore it was an asset and uh, definitely helped out in that particular scenario. Okay? I think that was the last slide. Great. So do we have any uh, questions for Nick in regard to the case study that was presented? Can you open up the uh, webinar and see if there's any remaining questions there? And I will say, the, in, in developing the case study, what we really tried to do was just bring in a lot of the recommendations, a lot of the planning suggestions that we had into that case scenario. Okay, and we say, for the webinar audience, to whom do we send the evaluation form? And that is from Jonathan. Jonathan, you can uh, email that to myself, uh, George Nicholas, and we will uh, make sure that we take that into consideration. Uh, or you could email it to Tessie Fields, who's also the co-chair of the training committee with myself, and we will uh, make sure that we look at those. So uh, everyone else on the webinar, we would certainly appreciate your, your help with that. We take those evaluations seriously. So we don't have any other questions. So at this point, I would like to uh, thank the
the presenters. I think you guys did an excellent job. Could I get a round of applause for the presenters? And again, the, this document is posted on the DEP SRP webpage under the guidance library. The next document that we anticipate up will be child care centers, and we will announce the training uh, when we have that scheduled. And I think that is all for today. Please, again, uh, remember to do your evaluation forms, write them out, and Tessie will collect those for in-house audience as you guys uh, exit the room. And thank you very much. We certainly appreciate your participation.